Welcome to the New Thinking for a New World podcast, where we explore the most pressing issues that are challenging and changing our societies. We are looking for new thinking and new solutions wherever we can find them. Listen as host Alan Stoga, the Talberg Foundation's chairman, challenges his guests for analysis, ideas and actions. Together, we can help make our world at least a bit better. War is ugly, but the residue of war, broken people, families, and their towns and cities can be even uglier. Worse, many modern conflicts never really end, which means, like a smoldering forest fire, they're prone to reignite again and again. So the casualties of many modern wars never have a chance to heal. That describes places like Syria, the West Bank and Gaza, Bosnia, parts of Africa, and elsewhere, where on again, off again, conflicts impact generations of people. In a globalizing world where war was supposed to be a thing of the past, that shouldn't be happening, which ironically may be part of the explanation for why it is. We too quickly move on to the next issue, assuming that what's done is done. War correspondents and war photographers know better. My guest today, Janine De Giovanni, has spent much of her celebrated career so far reporting from the Balkans, Africa and the Middle East. She has seen, maybe witnessed is a better word, the worst of what mankind can do to itself, but also the best that people under extraordinary circumstances can do for others. And that balance between evil and good comes through in her reporting. Welcome, Janine. Thank you so much. Very nice to be here, Alan. Let me start with a very simple question before talking about specific conflicts and specific places. Why do you do what you do? I feel it's really important to to first to bear witness to atrocities, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and then secondly, to document them. Um, in my case, I do it so that I hope that they will eventually be used in war crime tribunals because I really believe that unless there is transitional justice, justice of any kind for victims or survivors, there, there's very little closure. And that means that countries don't heal. And if they don't heal, heal, there will eventually be another cycle of violence. And we've seen this over and over again. It's really important to bring justice after terrible events have occurred. So I think, I think in a nutshell, that is, that is really my, my calling in life. Witness is important. Um, and I guess the obvious question is whether it's working or not. Is it something in our modern societies that aren't using the witness you bear in, in, in the right way? Why do, why do these conflicts keep on repeating themselves? Well, first of all, I think it's human nature to just shut down when you, you've seen so much graphic imagery of violence or war um, or humanitarian catastrophes. It's just there, there's actually documentation. It's called compassion fatigue. So there's only so much that, that people can take in while they're watching the evening news, whether it's the tide of refugees coming from Syria or the collapse of Afghanistan or the, the misery of the, of the uh, occupation in the West Bank and Gaza. Or I think that people then feel they do, there are some people, and I'm one of them, that I feel we have an obligation to never look away. So, I mean, my job really is to kind of straddle that balance and to help people um, to present them extremely complicated issues. Look, the war in Syria, the war in Bosnia were unbelievably multifaceted, very complicated conflicts, as in Yemen. In fact, I teach these, these three conflicts at Yale. And going through them, I realized that even whilst I was in the middle of reporting them, something else would inevitably happen. A new faction w would arise or a new alliance. And they're, they're difficult to comprehend. So the real challenge is for someone like me who is deeply embedded in it and, and you know, working on minutia to present that to a wider audience. And, and the way I do that is I try to do it by telling narratives. So letting the people tell their stories, whether my book on Syria is basically voices of Syrian people 
telling what happened to them, whether they were tortured, taken out of their villages, expelled from their country. And my most recent book is about Christian minorities in the Middle East who are facing eradication. So again, I let them tell their stories. And I find that's a very useful technique to take extremely complicated, whether it's themes or uh, or situations or geopolitics and bringing it to a wider audience. In a sense, it's storytelling. That's a very simplistic way of, of describing it. But I would say what I do is go to these places. I spend long periods of time. And then I try to, to en encapsulate it into a way that people will want to read it or want to try to understand it. And I suppose at the heart of it, is that most of the people I write about or talk about are not very different from you or I. And they have the same belief, which is that they just want a roof over their head. They want to protect their families. They want to educate their children. They want to live peaceful lives. And if I can try to get that message um, to readers or people who pick up my books, then I, I feel like I've succeeded. Let me push on that a little bit. You wrote that war is something I know well. And obviously, that's a true statement. Um, but undoubtedly, that was knowledge that was painfully gained and even more painfully sustained. War continues. And if we could gather the leaders of the most important countries in your classroom, instead of your students, we, we have uh, President Biden and President Xi and President Putin and maybe a couple others. And like your students, they had to pay attention. What would you want them to know from your experience? What, what have you learned that maybe could persuade people who have agency, who have power to behave differently? That often the, the, the responses of leaders, politicians, even UN officials are often so cynical that they, they literally, the regard for the people that war affects the most, which of course is civilians and the innocents who have nothing to do with it, um, that most of these people are willing to sacrifice their own people. And I don't mean President Biden. Um, I mean, I'm talking more about Bashar al-Assad, um, Saddam Hussein, people like this who really were willing to sacrifice their own people for their own political gains and cynical gains. And I would like them, if I could sit down with them, I'd like to say, I would like to tell you the story of what happened to one child in Aleppo when your barrel bombs hit their house. Or I'd like to tell you the story of this person that you incarcerated for doing nothing and the torture that they endured. Or I'd like to tell President Putin about the one to two million refugees that are going to be flooding into Poland if his troops do um, begin aggression into Ukraine. So I, I would like them to see the human side of war. And that's what I do. Um, you know, I am so not interested in embedding with military. I, the only military I've ever embedded with were with rebel soldiers in Africa or Bosnian Muslim forces or Chechen forces. I mean, you know, doing a kind of, um, I have embedded once or twice with the U.S. Army or the British Army in Afghanistan, and it's just not me to be told what to do, what I can write, where I can go. I really like to be a free spirit, a free agent, roaming around, doing what I do best, which is staying for long periods of time, trying to immerse myself into people's lives, and then writing about it in a way that um, it brings their story very much to your living room. Um, and, you know, it, it's harder than it sounds because you have to get somewhere, you have to be able to absorb a culture, let's say the Syrian war, which shifted, shape-shifted over the, it's going into its 11th year now, um, the various factions, the Islamic State, the, the, the Free Syrian Army splitting up and, and many other jihadist groups taking hold, the entrance of the Russia in 2015, the failed diplomacy, there were so many levels of it. And so to pull that all together, 
um, and try to bring that into a solid piece is, is really challenging. And, you know, one wonderful thing about getting older is that um, I now kind of, I, I finally worked out how to do it. Like I have my own templates or every war is different, but wars always have common threads. And, you know, I think I've reported 18 conflicts. Um, and I now can see, for instance, similarities between what happened in Bosnia and what happened in Syria. Let's pivot to something, some of the ones that you have recently reported on. You have an absolutely terrific piece in the January Vanity Fair on Gaza. Yes, yes. And it is, as I reread it before we talked today, um, it's it really is quite positive because you're you're and you've, you've spent a lot of time in Gaza and, and in the territories. Um, but it's a very positive story about people who are creating lives in spite of of their circumstances. Much of the world seems to have forgotten about the place, though. Um, why are you optimistic or are you optimistic is maybe a better question. I'm. I'm optimistic that Gaza has tremendous potential. I'm not optimistic that the conflict will be solved soon because I think people, you're absolutely right, people have forgotten about it. But the reason why, I mean, the piece on Gaza focuses on generation, I think they're called Z now, aren't they? So young people, let's say between 20 and 30. And um, why I wanted to focus on them was after the May bombing, which was absolutely devastating. More than 260 people were killed, uh, many of them children, most of them innocent people, not combatants. Um, I felt that I have written so much about the political situation in Gaza, about Hamas, about the Israeli occupation. And of course, Israel has pulled out, but psychologically they're still there because there's this fear that they can bomb whenever they choose to. And um, they you know, control all restriction of movement, um, electricity cut. So, so you know, their, their presence is very real indeed. Um, I want it to focus on the tremendous, I want to say resilience, but actually resilience isn't a term I like because then it sort of allows for what is happening to them to continue. I'd say more that they are tremendously resourceful um, and they're able, I mean, first of all, Young Gazans are some of the best educated people in the Middle East. Um, I think they have more children going to preschool than in any other um, place in the region. Um, most of the people I know speak several languages. Um, and, you know, despite the misery, the absolute humanitarian catastrophe of two million people shoved into seven miles by 14 miles with um, only a couple hours of electricity a day, most of them in refugee camps where they've been where they've been wallowing since 1948, since they were expelled from their villages and their um, their cities after the creation of the state of Israel. I want it to focus on something else, like those who have said, OK, this what am I going to do now? I'm going to educate myself. I'm going to become an engineer and I'm going to develop solar panels or I'm going to become a farmer and I'm going to invent new ways of using irrigation or young women who are saying, you know, we are bucking against the conservative um, Muslim background that we come from and we are going to be designers and I'm going to be a mother, but I'm going to go out there and work. And so the people I came across on this trip were just remarkable. And they, they fill me with a kind of pride and also, you know, what they are up against. If, if we could lift the yoke of oppression from their shoulders, what they could achieve is would be remarkable. But let me interrupt right there, because isn't that the conundrum, that yoke? And it is the Palestinian Authority and it is Hamas and it is Israel and it is Egypt. Um, that yoke isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So, so you, you, uh, yes, there's hope. Yes, they're doing amazing things. They are amazing people, um, but it's an overdetermined equation, isn't it? Well, I'm hoping that that article will be read by by people in Washington. You know, I, I'm hoping it was in Vanity Fair, which is a, you know, which it's the first time they've done a foreign story in several years, and I was really excited about it. And I do hope 
that President Biden or Mrs. Biden reads it. And I think we have to start peace talks again. I mean, I remember so well when Oslo was signed and Oslo was deeply flawed, as we know. But I remember going out to Gaza and standing on a beach with a friend of mine who had been imprisoned and brutally tortured in an Israeli prison. He was a Palestinian activist. And and we what we saw ahead of us was a Gaza that was going to open up, perhaps an airport, the port of Gaza, which has tremendous, by the way, Gaza, if it was cleaned up, has is one of the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful coastlines. So imagine the potential of tourism if you ever got to that state or outsourcing. Um, why use Chennai in the Philippines only? Why not use Gaza, where people speak excellent English and they're they're tech wizards? So I, I just think there's a lot of potential. So what could be done? I think. First of all, I'm endlessly disappointed at the U.S. foreign policy towards Israel. And um, basically, even during the May bombing, Biden's response was, to me, shocking, um, supporting Israel no matter what. Um, But the rest of the world wasn't. I mean, I think more people stood up during the May bombing, more Jewish students on campus, more Jewish um, liberal groups, um, more uh, certainly more European leaders who always, I think, have more awareness of, of the, 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 the suffering that the Palestinian people undergo. Um, I think that it was a wake up call. I really do. And maybe I am being optimistic, but it is my dream and my hope in my lifetime that I see some kind of, ah, peace is too big a word. You know, you can never really use peace in terms of the Middle East, but some kind of, uh, a, a relief of their of their immense, immense suffering. Do you know leaders that sound like these? Leaders, young or old, who are changing the world? Who are not content with what is and are willing to work for what could be? If so, nominate them for the Talberg SNF Eliasson Global Leadership Prize at talbergprize.org. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G prize.org. Let's segue to another place that you know perhaps too well and wrote about again recently, as recently as December, uh, which is the Balkans. Yes, yes. And your piece, but but other others as well, suggest that uh, wars that should have been finished, solved, resolved as long ago as the Dayton Accords, are beginning to bubble up again. Um, Disturbing signs that the conflict between Serbs and Muslims uh, could restart, uh, that the the results of Dayton could could spin apart. That was supposed to be, Europe was in charge of (laughs) of resolving, of maintaining, of, of creating a new space there. Why do you suspect it's beginning, why do you think it's beginning to come apart? or threatens to come apart is maybe a fairer way to say it. Well, Alan, you know, in 1995, when the Dayton Accords ended the war and did end the bloodshed, they were faulty. Um, Alia Izabegovic was basically bullied by Milosevic and by Richard Holbrook to to give away chunks of land that that the Bosnians were just beginning to take back. Remember, they had a a brutal arms embargo imposed on them from the beginning of the war. So it was, it really was a David versus Goliath conflict. Um, and people often say it was a civil war. Well, it wasn't a civil war. It was a, very clearly a war of aggression. Um, and the Bosnians were, were the underdogs. So by the end of the war, Izabegovic was a broken man. Um, he signed to end the killing, but the Dayton basically rewarded the perpetrators of the horrific violence and crimes, the systematic rape, the rape camps of Focha, the ethnic cleansing, the torture, the the destruction of Sarajevo. Um, And, you know, the Serbs walked away with, 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 you know, compensation for it. The other thing that I truly believe is something we touched upon earlier, transitional justice did not work in Bosnia. And for instance, um, Srebrenica, 8,000 men and boys, Muslim men and boys, were slaughtered. 
Um, and this Srebrenica, as far back as 1993, um, I was sitting in Sarajevo and in central Bosnia, knowing full well that Srebrenica was going to fall. And when it fell, the Serbs wanted it desperately. So we knew Europe, the international community, the West, what would happen. And yet we allowed it to happen. So imagine the bitterness of people. If you, if it was your brother, your father, your son, who was murdered in those woods. So, and then the, what is happening now is this revival of nationalism coming from Banja Luka, which is the Republika Srpska, their tin pot republic, um, created out of out of Dayton, and and of course you know the strings being pulled from from Belgrade, um, and there is you know the Croats also want their their more you know their secession the so it's it's beginning to bubble as you say it's beginning the the signs of a potential breakaway again for those of us who lived through it you know we look at these sort of trigger warnings and get very anxious because the way april 6 1992 30 years ago this spring war descended in europe and it happened so quickly like literally one day my friends were going to work the next day the tanks were on the street in sarajevo the snipers were positioned on the hills shooting down onto civilians the mortars started coming sometimes hundreds a day and the war went on and sarajevo became the longest running siege in modern military history so i mean we allowed that to happen and i think if we see the warning signs now we it, it's really our obligation to do everything in our power to try to um, use conflict prevention to, to prevent another devastating war in the heart of Europe. Well, let me ask, though, I, one of the words that I think should be banned from our language without specific definition is we. So when you say we, who specifically should? That's right. I know I do that far too often. The international community. I mean, we're Israel, international. Whoa, whoa, wait, stop right there. Who's the international community? Well, now I know what you're going to say because during the Bosnian War, um, Amer the American for Clinton's administration basically felt that the Europeans should sort it out, right? But you remember the famous words of of Lord Owen saying, "Don't dream dreams. Don't think the West is going to come in and save you." Well. I think that we had a moral responsibility. We, again, we, okay, I specifically, I was living in London. I have French nationality, but I was born in America. So I think I kind of encompass. You're a we. You are actually are a we. I am the we. Um, so the international community, whether it was in the form, the UN peacekeepers at the time had a very shoddy mandate, which is that they couldn't fire unless they were fired upon. So that meant that they were paralyzed in Sarajevo, which a city where civilians were being targeted and killed deliberately. Um, so it was, I mean, from start to finish, Bosnia, like Syria, by the way, was handled very badly. And, and I do believe the war in Bosnia could have ended far sooner and 250,000 people would be alive today in the same way that, you know, different conflicts, but in 2013, when Eastern Ghouta was chemically gassed, um, it would have been very easy to have, I'm not saying 100,000 boots on the ground, I am saying strategic strikes against Bashar al-Assad's military compound. Assad is a bully. And the only way to stand up to bullies is to stand up to them. And I truly believe the Syrian war would have slowed down. The Russians would not have gotten involved and we would not be looking at the scenario that we're looking at today. And the same thing with Bosnia. Bosnia did not have to drag on for three and a half years. If we, the West, we, the United States, we, NATO, we, we some combination of those powers had intervened early and, and often. I, you know, why did we, the West, NATO... 19 countries, go to war for Kosovo, much smaller country. Um, basically, how many years later? Four years later, 1999. 
19 NATO countries went to war for a tiny Balkan country that most people had never heard of. Not Sorry, not a country. Uh, a, 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 it was then a part of the former Yugoslavia. Um, yet the international community or NATO alliance went to war for Kosovo. So an illegal humanitarian intervention. And 78 days later, the Serbs fled. Uh, the Albanian, Kosovo Albanians were protected. The war was over. Kosovo has issues, of course, but it's kind of looked at as more or less a success story compared to Bosnia. All things are relative. Um, let me pivot then just for a moment. I, I wasn't going to ask this, but I, I have to ask about Ukraine. You are a seasoned war reporter. You know how to read the straws in the wind. Um, what, do you, what are you thinking about Ukraine? Do you ask me a month ago? I would have said I didn't think Putin was going to do this because I think that um, he's, a, as we know, a brilliant strategist, a chess player. He plays for the long term. He plays for the long game. Um, domestically, he's not doing well. But now I'm beginning to think that because domestically he needs to flare, that to, to have the nationalism flare up that this might be playing to his advantage. And I also think that he's been simmering for years since 1999 and 2004 and five when NATO did begin its expansion. So he's had this kind of simmering rage that the West is encroaching onto his territory and that the, the two um, provinces are ethnically Russian. So, Look, I, the last thing I want to see is a war, specifically for, I'm looking at it from a humanitarian point of view. Again, one to two million refugees is the project, projection, which is a hell of a lot, going through Poland, um, trying to get into, you know, fortress Europe. Um, France, look at, uh, French elections are coming up. The right wing has been really dominating, and part of that is, of course, anti-immigration. Um, UK is, you know, it didn't take many Syrian refugees to start with. The Scandinavian countries have been trying to send back Syrian refugees. And Angela Merkel, who was our moral leader during the refugee crisis in 2015, is gone. So I see a humanitarian catastrophe if Putin goes through with it. Whether or not he will, I mean, the latest news flash is that he's pulled back some troops, but um, it hasn't been confirmed. Um, you know, I was in Chechnya. I saw what he did to Grozny. I was in Grozny when it fell. Um, I've worked in Russia. I know that he is someone that will, in brutality and force is not something he shies from. So if you ask me today, is he going to do it? I'm far more inclined to say he will than I would have a month ago. But what I really fear is the, the, what will happen after that, um, the level of casualty, civilian casualty, military casualty, and, and the tide of people that will be fleeing, desperately fleeing. So, um, again, would he consider that? I don't think so, because th those refugees aren't going back into Russia. They're going to be going towards Europe. And, of course, one of his aims is to destabilize Europe. And what would, what would have a more destabilizing effect than that many displaced people. There is a wonderful quote from a Syrian expatriate in your book. Our present is a failure, but our past is glorious. Yes. And that strikes me as something that so many of the places you've worked, uh, including Russia, um, it, it really does describe their realities. And it seems to me that that may well be ultimately the problem. Let me just finish by asking you about the new book, yes. um, which is The Vanishing. And, and, and you a, again, you tell stories and you tell stories about Christians and Christian communities uh, that are disappearing from, as you, as you call it in your title, the land of the prophets. Um, what is the moral of the story? Why do you care about those people and their faith and, their, and, and the disappearance of those communities? I think they're ancient people and they're deeply tied to their ancestral lands. They've been there for 2000 years. 
in the case of the Iraqi Christians, um, Gazans have been there since the, until the fourth century, Gaza was entirely Christian. If we lose these people, um, we lose uh, uh, the mosaic of each country will be altered forever. As an, one Iraqi ambassador said to me, without the Christians of Iraq, there is no Iraq. And, you know, we've, we, the, the Jewish community of Iraq was so important, so vital to society, to culture, to, to economics. And they all but gone, you know, in, by the 1970s. There's very few, there's a few people left, but not many. And I just think once you lose these diverse communities, you really lose any kind of inclusion. And um, for that, so why do I care about them? For that reason, but also because I believe that they don't have voices. So they, very few people know about them, even in America, you know, a so-called largely Christian country, even the evangelical churches um, aren't really aware of the plight that these people are going, going through. And social scientists reckon that in a hundred years, a hundred years, they will be gone. That, you know, migration, radical extremist groups, climate change, lack of industry, um, what ISIS did to them in 2014, which, you know, destroyed their farmlands, uh, killed their irrigation pipes, that they will be gone. And this, you know, these biblical, ancient people, for them to vanish from this part of the world would be an, an absolute catastrophe. So that, that's why I care. Janine, you've we you weathered COVID in France and in the United States. Um, what happens next? What's next on, on what, what comes up next? I'm, um, for me personally, I'm beginning a book about war crimes. Um, and it will be kind of a memoir. I think I'm finally at the age. I've been doing this now for more than 30 years. And so it's a book about war crimes. It's called Unspeakable Knowledge because, of course, you know, once you see these things, you can never unsee them. Um, I can't, you know, in many ways, I feel honored to have lived through what I've lived through, to have seen what I've seen, but none of it, you know, I can never erase any of it. And to this day, someone, um, I just met someone who made a feature film about Sarajevo, and he sent me the trailer. And I can't watch it without welling up with tears and feeling, you know, deeply emotional and deeply tied to that place. So, you know, I feel tremendously honored and privileged to have been able to live through these things. Um, and I think the time has come now to be able to write a memoir that's kind of linked in with all of the war crimes that I've witnessed. I've witnessed two genocides in my life. Um, and, you know, three if you count the Yazidis too, but, um, but you know, the. Srebrenica and Rwanda, and um, you know those marked me completely as as a human being, and um, so that's my next project. It's called um, Unbearable Knowledge. Sorry, I said unspeakable knowledge. Unbearable knowledge. I think either of those titles would work, but unbearable is even even more powerful. Thank thank you very much for this conversation, and thank you for um, for the work you've been doing. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Please rate our show on Apple Podcasts and subscribe. Meanwhile, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter at talbergfoundation.org to learn more about our work. That's T-A-L-L-B-E-R-G foundation.org. Thank you, and we'll be back again next week for another episode of Talberg's New Thinking for a New World. This podcast was brought to you through the generous support of SNF, the Stavros Nyarkos Foundation. <laughs>